Uh, we are going to start, so uh, please uh, go back to the seat and... Um, prepared for your tea and um okay so uh we are go we are um we are starting the uh, panel two um the panel one uh, we are going to we talked about uh, international relations uh from the uh, macro perspective um, now it's more like a micro perspective. Um, I'm, a, um, I'm a scholar of comparative politics uh, who has studied the um, politics, uh, domestic politics, um, especially uh, China. But uh, um, so uh, from my perspective, uh, domestic politics provides micro foundation uh, to uh, international relations. Uh, many international relations scholars uh, disagree with that view, but um, I, I think. Um, uh, domestic politics uh, provides a micro foundation, and then we are going to talk about those uh, micro foundations of international relations of East Asia, especially US Japan relations. The first speaker is my colleague uh, of uh, SMU, uh, Dr. Matthew Wilson, uh, also my uh, office neighbor, <laughs> uh, and uh, also my uh, colleague of uh, baseball fan. <laughs> um, and uh, so actually we are uh, competing with each other for a certain game. <laughs> uh, and uh, so he's an expert of American politics and I invited him to talk about uh, uh, my, uh, American politics, uh, domestic American uh, politics perspective uh, and uh, its implication uh, on um, international relations uh, through U.S. foreign policy. And he's going to start, uh, today he talks about American domestic politics and the international order in the age of Trump. Uh, Matthew is the uh, methodologically uh, very sophisticated uh, quantitative methods uh, he uses. And uh, he's a, a starter of, uh, um, of uh, uh, public policy uh, survey, uh, and he's a prominent uh, political psychologist uh, in the field of American politics. Uh, please join me for welcoming Dr. Matthew Wilson. Thank you very much. I'm really happy to have the opportunity to be here at KGU. This is my second visit uh, to KGU, and I enjoyed the first time so much. I was delighted uh, to be invited back here. And what I want to talk about today is this new political phenomenon that fueled the rise of Donald Trump. Uh, Trump's election, of course, caught observers by surprise, both within the United States uh, and around the world. And a lot of people have asked, what are the key elements of the Trumpist worldview, if you will, or the Trumpist ideology? That is, what are the preferences that distinguish the supporters who fueled Donald Trump's rise from traditional Republicans and certainly from Democrats. Because one of the things that I think is quite apparent is that Donald Trump and his supporters have distinctive ideological orientations and distinctive policy preferences that set them apart not only from Democrats, but also from the core traditional elements of the Republican Party. Uh, in a lot of respects, Donald Trump looks like an independent or third party candidate in the sense of bucking the traditional orthodoxy of his own party as much as he uh, you know, bucks the preferences of the other political party. So uh, what I'm gonna do today is show you some data from the 2016 American National Election Studies that will allow us to compare the policy orientations and political preferences of Trump's supporters to the policy orientations and political mm -hmm. preferences of people who supported other Republican candidates in the primaries uh, as compared to people who supported Hillary Clinton or people who supported Bernie Sanders. And we'll get a sense of where the Trump base looks different and where it looks similar to other factions in American politics. And I'll particularly emphasize what the implications of that would be, of those similarities and differences, would be for uh, American foreign policy and particularly for East Asia. 
So Donald Trump is, as I said, very clearly an unconventional Republican. Uh, he criticized the Republican quote-unquote establishment as much as he criticized the other party. He made it very clear that he was willing to go against a traditional bipartisan consensus in a whole host of areas, including uh, bipartisan consensus on both foreign and domestic policy. So things that Republicans and Democrats had traditionally agreed on, like emphasizing the NATO alliance, emphasizing a robust American presence around the world, generally favoring free trade, Donald Trump was willing to question all of that. Uh, and in doing so, he made uncomfortable a variety of people in both political parties, and he put himself outside what had been the bipartisan mainstream of American politics. So as I said, what we're going to look at is uh, based on public opinion data, on what issues are the people who supported Donald Trump? And here I mean the people who supported him in the primary. And I think it's really critical to look at the primary election because, you know, a fair number of Americans, fair number of Republicans, in the end, voted for Donald Trump because he was the Republican candidate. Right? Party loyalty in the United States is pretty strong. And you have a significant chunk of people who weren't particularly enamored of Donald Trump, who wished that someone else had been the Republican nominee. But at the end of the day, when it's just a binary choice between a Democrat and a Republican, they held their nose and voted for Trump. Those aren't the people that I'm principally interested in. What I'm principally interested in today are the people who delivered the Republican nomination to Donald Trump in the first place. Right? What are the preferences of his core supporters, his true base, the people that wanted Donald Trump to be the Republican nominee? Because I think that gives us some insight into what his own core coalition will be pushing for in the foreign policy arena as well as other areas. So just quickly, my answers to this are going to be based on data from the American National Election Studies, major nationwide uh, political survey, large enough, over 4,000 respondents, so that we have a big sample size to get a good look at what people in all of these different categories believe. So we have significant numbers of people who voted for Trump in the Republican primary, voted for other candidates in the Republican primary, voted for Hillary Clinton in the Democratic primary, and voted for Bernie Sanders in the Democratic primary. And we can compare all four of those groups. So where do... Trump voters differ from other Republicans. Well, it's a hodgepodge of issues. So in all of these areas, the people who supported Trump are significantly different from the people who supported other Republican candidates. Immigration, that's not a surprise. We'll come back to that one. Trade, also not a surprise. We'll come back to that. Law and order, okay? Trump supporters are uh, much... Uh, take a much uh, stricter stance on issues of crime and punishment, criminal justice, than other Republicans. Um, Hawkishness and isolationism, and we'll come back to this because those two things in some ways are in tension with each other, right? The Trump supporters are simultaneously more in favor of a robust American military capability, but also more reluctant to use that military capability uh, in overseas engagement. So I'll talk a little bit about the implications of, of that simultaneous hawkishness and isolationism. They're more supportive of government spending than other Republicans. Right? Trump supporters are not traditional fiscal conservatives. They support a big, robust welfare state. Trump opposed any cuts to Social Security or Medicare, so he's certainly not a traditional conservative in that sense. And then there are a few weird issues that I would call quirky libertarianism where the Trump voters are different, but that would be of more interest to an American audience than here, so I'm not going to dwell on those things. Um, now... It's also worth noting that on a variety of important issues, there are no differences, okay? So on some things, Trump voters look just like other Republicans, right? On health care, the environment, affirmative action, abortion, taxes, a lot of domestic issues, Trump voters look a lot like other Republicans. So they're not different on everything, but they're different on enough key issues that we would expect a different policy course. Okay, so what really matters for East Asia in terms of the distinctiveness of Trump voters. First of all, attitudes towards immigration are significantly different. And, you know, we have kind of a misconception in the United States. When Americans talk about immigration policy, we assume that all immigrants are from Latin America, right? Uh, the general American view of an immigrant is someone from Mexico. Um, and sure, a lot of immigrants are from Mexico. 
But there are a lot of immigrants from East Asia in the United States, right? There are a lot of Chinese and Vietnamese and Koreans, et cetera, right? So a lot of East Asian immigrants in the US. So that's something that's of relevance uh, to this part of the world. Even more so attitudes towards trade, right? That, that is the different views of free trade between Trump supporters and others are of great consequence here. Um, this preference for more isolation and less engagement is something we've been talking about through the whole conference. So that's gonna be important. Um, and then finally, threat perceptions and the tendency towards hawkishness. And as I say, I'll talk about what the interaction of those two things is. Okay, so from here on, I've got some, some actual data. And in each of these cases, I'm going to compare four different groups. People who supported Trump in the primaries, people who supported other Republicans in the primaries, people who supported Hillary Clinton in the primaries, and people who supported other Democrats. Now, other Democrats, for all practical purposes, means Bernie Sanders, because he was the only other meaningful uh, Democratic candidate in the race. Okay, so let's look at this question on immigration. Do you think the number of immigrants from foreign countries who are permitted to come to the United States to live should be increased a lot, increased a little, left the same, decreased a little, or decreased a lot? Core question on immigration. As you can see, among the bottom three groups, the modal response, the most common response is to say, leave it the same, okay? Immigration levels should be left about the same as they are. Among Trump supporters, the modal response is decreased a lot, okay? That's a significant difference, and they stand out from all of the other three groups in terms of their preferences on, on immigration. So we know that that's gonna be a distinguishing element of the Trump base. Foreign imports. This is a question on tariffs, right? Do you favor or, or, impose, or oppose placing new limits on imports? 86% of Trump's primary supporters want new tariffs. It's overwhelming, okay? So, I mean, for all practical purposes, everyone, who, or virtually everyone who supported Trump in the primaries wants more limits on foreign imports. Given that political pressure from his own base, you know that that's where he's going to be coming from consistently in terms of policy. Other groups are much more divided, right? Including other Republicans. For all these other three groups, it's a much more even split between people who you know, want more free trade versus people who want greater uh, restrictions, but not for Trump. Um, interestingly enough, the only group where a majority opposed limits on foreign imports was Hillary Clinton's supporters. Um, you know, kind of traditional uh, center left free trade Democrat. That was essentially how she positioned herself. Even though she came out in opposition to the TPP, most people didn't really believe her when she said she was opposed to the TPP. They thought she would have found a way to support it in the end if she had been elected. Um, free trade agreements. Do you favor, oppose, or neither favor nor oppose the US making free trade agreements uh, with other countries. So um, only 29% of Trump primary voters either strongly or moderately favored making free trade agreements with other countries, right? Now, what's interesting is that a lot of people um, in all the categories are neutral on this question. It's because a lot of people don't really know and understand that much about free trade agreements. So a lot of people take the neutral position because they don't understand the issue very well. This is you know, a frequent feature of public opinion on trade issues. But here's an interesting one on isolationism. Now this is, let me note that this question is a very strong and absolutist articulation of the isolationist position. So to agree with this is saying a lot, right? To say this country would be better off if we just stayed home and did not concern ourselves with problems in other parts of the world. Right? Fully a third of Trump's supporters agree with that, right? That we should just stay home, just complete, that's a complete isolationist view. Much smaller numbers of other Republicans and of Hillary Clinton's supporters agree with that. But interestingly, on this question, the Bernie Sanders people look just like the Donald Trump people, right? Bernie Sanders supporters show the same levels of isolationist sentiment as Trump supporters. And this is one of the issues where there was a kind of a strange bipartisan consensus between the Trump people and the far left of the Democratic Party. And we see that on several foreign policy questions. Defense spending. Now, here's a very interesting one. 
Some people believe we should spend much less money for defense. Others feel that defense spending should be greatly increased. And of course, some other people have opinions somewhere in between. Where would you place yourself on this scale? Look how different the Trump supporters are from everyone else. A majority of Trump supporters say we should spend much more, right? Most of Trump supporters want the United States to dramatically increase defense spending. And this is, in fact, what happened with Trump's first budget, right? Trump did follow through on this commitment. He asked for a significant increase in military funding and got it, okay? By contrast, um, other Republicans tend to be in favor, but not as overwhelmingly so. And, and Democrats tend to be neutral to opposed, right? I mean, Hillary Clinton's supporters, on average, said we should keep defense spending about the same, and Bernie Sanders' supporters want to spend less. Okay, they want a smaller U.S. military. Now, this question is really important with regard to East Asia, because if you think about it, you know, one of the concerns that people in Japan and elsewhere had about American foreign policy under President Obama was that the United States was not maintaining sufficient military spending and capacity to project force effectively in East Asia along with everywhere else in the world where the U.S. You know, wanted to project force. So there were concerns that the U.S. might not be willing to spend enough militarily to maintain the same level of global commitment that they traditionally had. Well, clearly the Trump people want to spend enough money. That's not the problem, right? It's not that uh, Trump supporters want to go cheap on the military, and nor Trump himself, right? The question is, if you're going to spend more to build a more robust military presence, what do you want to do with it? How do you want to use this, this robust military? Here's an interesting one. Perceptions of threat from China. Do you think China's military is a major threat to the security of the United States, a minor threat, or not a threat? Notice that Trump supporters have the greatest threat perception from China of any group. A very strong majority, 63%, believe that China's military is a major threat to the United States. Uh, other Republicans lean in that direction, but not so dramatically, whereas a, a plurality of Democrats, interestingly, think that China is a minor threat to the United States. This is an important difference in threat perception uh, that would shape differential policies in East Asia. If you see China as a major threat to the United States militarily, that's going to dictate a different set of Asia policies than if you see China's military threat as kind of a minor threat consideration. Okay, I'm going to skip those things because I want to, oops, I want to uh, talk some about um, the uh, implications here. So let's think about, so I've taken you through a lot of data, right, a lot of data to show the differences between Trump supporters and others. I want to take a step back now and talk about the implications of some of these issues for uh, America's role in East Asia and uh, for America's relationship with Japan. On the pro-engagement side, if what we want to see is the United States to continue actively engaged in East Asia, providing security guarantees in East Asia, nurturing alliances in East Asia, there are a couple of things here that could support that, right? Trump's base wants to spend a lot on the U.S. military, which is a necessary ingredient of a continued robust American presence in East Asia. Trump's base also greatly fears the military rise of China. Right? That would dictate continuing engagement in East Asia. Right? If you're afraid of China and you have military capacity, presumably you're going to deploy it here. Right? Presumably you're going to have resources committed around, in and around Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, etc. On the other hand, we clearly see that a significant number of Trump voters are wary about U.S. internationalism, right? There's an isolationist streak. So what does this mean for countries like Japan that would like to see the U.S. continue to be engaged in East Asia? Well, <laughs> ironically, the implication here is that you need to scare us 
<laughs> that is, you need to convince Donald Trump and his supporters that there is something to fear, that an American presence and robust American engagement is necessary to fend off the threat of China. Trump and his supporters are going to be more persuaded by threat arguments than they're going to be persuaded by multilateral opportunity arguments. Okay? If you talk about the wonderful possibilities for the United States to be involved in multilateral trade agreements in East Asia or to be part of you know, an international governing order, for Trump supporters, that's not, that doesn't sound all that appealing. Right? That sounds like something that costs a lot of money and isn't worth it. But if you say, you better be here with a bunch of aircraft carriers and a bunch of aircraft and troops because China is coming after the United States and the U.S. better be ready to counter it. Trump supporters hear that and say, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Right? The United States needs to be ready to counter the rise of China. So that means that the Trump administration and Trump supporters are willing to be just as engaged in East Asia as perhaps an, an, another administration would be, but for different reasons and in different ways. And I think that's something that needs to factor into the psychology of our friends and allies in Japan, in South Korea, et cetera, uh, as they, they think about these uh, kinds of issues. Um, moreover, I would very much echo, and I know I'm, I'm uh, running out of time here, I'll close pretty quickly. But I, I would uh, very much echo uh, the ambassador's remarks, which I think were right on target when he said that uh, Trump has a preference for bilateral relations, bilateral relationships, I think this is absolutely true. I think this is an important key to understanding um, one of the, the core foreign policy uh, orientations of Trumpism and of Donald Trump. And the reason is, if you think about it, from Trump's mentality, from his art of the deal mentality, and from a really crass real politic mentality, um, if you're the United States, of course you prefer bilateral relationships. Because in any bilateral relationship involving the United States, who's the dominant party? It's the United States, right? In any bilateral negotiation, the United States has the advantage. Because the United States is more militarily, more economically, more culturally powerful than any other single nation in the world. That advantage gets diffused and dissipated if you have to engage in multilateral negotiations. So, you know, Donald Trump, as much as any of us may not like him, he's not dumb. Uh, he has a certain kind of intuitive negotiator's intelligence. And he realizes, if I can get a country one-on-one, -on -one, I can use the preponderance of my advantage as the United States, as the hegemon, to get a better deal, right? And so there's a, there's a rationality to that. That I think, and I think that that, that underlies uh, what the ambassador rightly observed about the Trump administration's preference for bilateral negotiations. Uh, that also has implications for the way that nations of East Asia deal with the United States. So I would say very clearly, just to wrap things up, the rise of Trump signals a new force in American politics. As I showed you, on a whole host of issues, the preferences of Trump voters differ not only from Democrats, but even from other Republicans. Moreover, they do so in ways that have very tangible ramifications for East Asia. It means that, that the kinds of cooperation that are at the core of the liberal international order, right? cooperation on trade, cooperation on migration, cooperation on multilateral governance and agreements, all that stuff's going to be much less likely. His supporters simply are not interested in it. They're more suspicious of it than other Americans. But it does not preclude security cooperation. Because if the administration is convinced that there are genuine threats that have to be countered, they are willing to spend the money that it takes to counter them and to develop the bilateral security relationships to counter the rising power of China. So it doesn't mean that cooperation is impossible, but it means that cooperation is likely to be of a different kind with a different focus uh, than what we might have seen under another administration. And I'll leave it at that and we can talk more in the questions if we want to.
Thank you. Uh, the next speaker is uh, Dr. Justin Reeves, uh, my colleague and one of the, my uh, newest colleagues. And uh, um, last, uh, so when I came to SMU, um, Diana was the only one who is uh, studying um, Japanese studies. And uh, so I joined her, basically. And then a few years ago, we got a, a grant from um, Japan Foundation. And we, uh, we created the two um, Japanese studies positions. And then now uh, we, uh, we have uh, uh, hired um, Intra Sternsdorf Cisterna, who will speak in the panel three, and uh, Justin Reeves uh, last year. And then actually we have four Japan specialists in the social sciences. That's actually a lot uh, compared with uh, other uh, universities uh, in the United States, uh, if not most. So uh, uh, we are very uh, glad that to see the development of the Japanese studies uh, in SMU. And uh, Justin is uh, one of those who are contributing uh, to the studies of um, SMU, uh, of Japan in SMU and also uh, in the American South uh, in general. So uh, please join me for welcoming uh, Dr. Justin Reeves. All right, thank you, Hiroki, for that introduction. And, and I want to thank everyone at KGU for, for hosting this event. It's great to be here. So now we're at the, the part of the symposium where we're going to talk about domestic Japanese politics. And uh, given that we're in an era of, of heightened populism and identity politics, I have to say I'm a little wary of speaking to a Japanese audience as, as the gaijin white guy who is going to tell you about how politics work in your own country. Uh, but fortunately, on this panel, we also have Maruk-sensei and Yamada-sensei, so uh, they, can, they can correct any grave errors on my part. Uh, uh, so given our time constraints today, I've decided to focus on how domestic politics uh, impact the security dimension of the U.S. relationship rather than focus on the trade dimension. And, and I'll start by saying that, in general, I think most scholars agree uh, that Japan's security policy is still very much a work in progress, <clears throat> right? We've seen a gradual unraveling of the Yoshida Doctrine over the last few decades, this being the idea that, that Japan, its best option is to totally outsource its security uh, to the United States while focusing exclusively on the power and prestige that it can gain through, through economic growth. Um, but the question of what sort of grand strategy is going to replace that doctrine or that idea um, is still not settled, right? So there's ongoing debates uh, within Japan about the long-term viability uh, of maintaining the U.S.-Japan alliance as the country's primary guarantor uh, of security, um, and, and whether or not beefing up domestic military capabilities um, and or fostering a closer ties or, or, or having a closer alignment um, with other regional actors, as uh, Shibayama sensei was saying in our first panel with, with South Korea, or Dan was saying with India, uh, or Ambassador Shinyo was saying, uh, whether you know, pursuing a sort of regional security architecture akin to NATO might be uh, more sound options. And in the, the background of these larger discussions, there's a number of issues that serve to push Japan in one direction or the other, um, and which place constraints on the viability of those different options. So these include things like uh, difficulties with settling the Okinawa base relocation issue, um, uh, reaching a lasting accord with Japan's neighbors on, on history narratives, uh, or dealing with lingering wartime issues like comfort women. And of course, there's all the territorial disputes, um, uh, such as the competing claims over the Senkaku Jiaoyu uh, or Takushima Dokdo. Um, and all of these play a role in determining the eventual shape of, of security policy outcomes. But here today, uh, I wanted to focus on the very broad question uh, of Japan's foreign policy orientation in terms of either a closer, uh, a more balanced, or a more distanced uh, alignment with the United States. And specifically, what I'm interested in is um, what opinions and attitudes uh, we see in, in, on this question in the domestic political arena <coughs> uh, that might give us a window into what to expect. Okay. So, uh, it's always a bit of a risky enterprise trying to make hard predictions uh, in the realm of domestic politics, and that's especially true in Japan and now more than ever true in the United States. Um, likewise, predictions in the realm of international relations are, are even more fraught with uncertainty. Uh, but that's not to say we don't have any tools at our disposal for making assessments on these things. We do. 
in particular in recent years, there's been a, a lot of, uh, an increasing amount, I should say, of, of survey work done in Japan, which affords us a, a richer uh, view of, of opinions among politicians and ordinary citizens alike. <clears throat> and, and today I'd like to draw from, from some of that survey work to see whether we can uh, justifiably lay out some expectations uh, regarding who's likely to be in power uh, and where these parties or party leaders uh, stand on issues that are relevant to, to U.S.-Japan relations. So, so let me start with actually that second question um, and get at, at what differences we see among the parties uh, on these general issues. <clears throat> and here I'll be relying on, on data from a collaborative survey uh, conducted by Yomiri Shimbun and, and Waseda University um, that, that asked uh, candidates in last year's October elections a battery of different questions. Um, okay, so uh, what, you, what you see here is, is a violin plot uh, showing the, the <clears throat> uh, number of candidates within each party that were clustered along different ordinal responses to this question, the question being whether, uh, whether Japan should stress its relationship with the United States more than it should stress uh, its relationship with other Asian countries. And, and I'm sorry if this is kind of hard to see with the slide, um, but the, the bulges that are towards the top indicate clusters of candidates favoring ties with the U.S., while those uh, clusters, those bulges at the bottom indicate uh, candidates that, that favor closer ties to Asian countries. And, and the main takeaway point here is that in spite of how stable, uh, uh, secure, and robust the U.S.-Japan relationship uh, has been and continues to be in practice, um, there is a meaningful difference among the, the parties here. <clears throat> so Japan's trajectory since the Cold War um, has been pretty consistent with what, what Dick Samuels called, calls uh, salami slicing, uh, or a very gradual push towards normalization of its military capabilities and legal standing. Um, but as consistent as that slow trajectory has been in practice, it's not, it's not a valence issue in Japan, right? This is something that actually divides uh, the public and divides, uh, divides the parties. <clears throat> so what you see here is a stark contrast between the ruling coalition, those first two columns on the left, uh, as well as the other uh, right-leaning parties like Ishin and Hope, um, and, and the left-leaning uh, parties like the Japanese Communist Party, JCP, uh, the Social Democrats, and the newly formed center-left uh, Riken Minshito. Uh, the Constitutional Democratic Party, the CDP. And actually, you can see how the CDP itself is quite divided internally as they're, they're all over the place. Um, <clears throat> and you can actually see a similar pattern here with respect to candidate attitudes towards the leadership of different countries. <clears throat> um, uh, this time, the parties are, are in rows, uh, and the candidate clusters on ordinal responses are in columns. And, and there's two plots, the one on the left corresponding to Trump, the one on the right corresponding to Putin, where a cluster on the left side of the plot indicates that, that uh, they believe you should not strengthen the relationship with this leader, whereas the one on the right uh, indicates they believe you should uh, strengthen the relationship with that leader. <clears throat> so again, here there's this divide between the center left and the left on the one hand and, and the ruling coalition on the right on the other. Interestingly, um, though, when it comes to attitudes towards Xi Jinping and Moon Jae-in, um, it do, this actually does appear to be a valence issue. The parties, on the whole, seem to agree that stronger relations with China and Korea, or at least with their leaders, uh, are in Japan's interest, um, although they may have very different ideas of, of what the nature of those, those ties ought to be. <clears throat> um, of course, when it comes to the most salient uh, security issue of revising Article 9, of the Constitution. This is where the, the real divides come out. You can see almost perfect party unity uh, among all the parties up here, uh, with the single exception, actually, of the, of the CDP in the middle, um, which is pretty divided on it, the Rike Minchito. This, this is somewhat ironic because the party named itself after the very issue. Um, but the takeaway here is, again, there are meaningful differences between uh, the parties on, on major security issues, and particularly issues that are relevant to the US-Japan uh, relationship, which of course suggests that if we were to see a repeat of what happened in 2009 when the LDP was unseated by an uh, organized and, and temporarily popular opposition party, uh, that we could actually see uh, change in Japan's posture 
towards towards the U.S. But is that is that likely to happen? Um, well, let's take a look at at the ruling coalition's current standing, and here is where I'll get at that first question of who's who's likely to be in power. <clears throat> okay, so the the ruling LDP Kome coalition came into last year's election quite strong, and they came out quite strong as well in spite of what seemed like a, a potentially serious challenge uh, from the right in the form of Koike Yuriko's uh, uh, Hope Party. And actually that election was quite similar to 2012 in the sense that um, the, the leftist opposition was very divided, performed horribly, and this sort of upstart right-leaning populist party, then Ishin, and this time uh, Hope, uh, failed to live up to expectations. So the coalition now has a a uh, two-thirds supermajority in the lower house and is just 11 seats shy of a supermajority in the upper house, uh, which for the purposes of constitutional revision, they can you know, theoretically cobble together support from other right-leaning parties in the chamber, uh, like Ishin, for example. Um, but even if that falls short, uh, that would only jeopardize Abe's ambitions with constitutional reform whereas the rest uh, of the administration's foreign policy orientation, uh, like its cooperation with the United States, you know, that would presumably remain intact. <laughs> um, so it would, really take, it would really take an extraordinary electoral swing for the coalition to lose its simple majority in either chamber, um, which would require an opposition that is much more organized uh, and much, much more united than what we currently see uh, on the playing field. Okay, so in the realm of, of public opinion as well, there is not at all a groundswell uh, of support for, for any opposition group akin to what we saw in 2009 with the DPJ. <clears throat> so this is a plot of, of all the polling done by the major news outlets uh, like Asahi, Yomiuri, Nikkei uh, since, since the last election up until last week uh, on the question of party support among the electorate, uh, moving chronologically from, from left to right. And I've aggregated them together so you can see the combined support rate for uh, the ruling coalition on the top in red, and the combined support for all the different opposition groups um, in the green. And of course, there's a lot of variation uh, from, from poll to poll, from sample to sample, but what I think comes through clearly is that there's this huge 20-point gap on average between these uh, these two groups. Um, and that's, that's when you generously lump uh, all of the opposition groups into one camp, as though they could ever uh, uh, form a united front. But the reality is this, this opposition is quite a heterogeneous group, um, and they have some very serious ideological uh, divisions that would, that would make coming together quite difficult. <clears throat> um, so the takeaway here is that the prospects for another sort of 2009 like phenomenon, at least in the short term, leading up to the next upper house election of next year, um, are pretty low. And I guess I would say the prospects uh, are low beyond that as well. <clears throat> um, but that is not to say that everything is smooth sailing for the Abe administration uh, itself. If we look at this same polling data on cabinet support rates since the last election, we can see that Abe's support has dropped uh, pretty low. It's now it's in the 30s and it has been since March of this year. And this is largely because of, of renewed revelations and findings uh, regarding two different scandals that have been plaguing the administration for over a year. Um, <clears throat> both of these scandals are pretty unimportant substantively. Uh, and they involve kind of relatively low levels of, of cronyism um, it's not on par, for example, with uh, you know, the allegations surrounding the Mueller investigation in the United States, but they do, they do speak to a long-standing uh, mistrust of government and a sort of outrage over corruption that have been uh, endemic to Japanese elections for a long time. <clears throat> and in the case of the Abe scandals, the, the mounting evidence uh, of an attempted cover-up is, is really beginning to uh, be more politically damaging than the original scandals themselves were. Um, now you might ask, if these scandals are not redounding to the benefit of the opposition, um, as you just saw from that previous 
survey data. Well, then why do they matter politically? Uh, well, they matter because they could have an effect on internal party politics. Um, so every three years, the LDP holds a party presidential election, <clears throat> which is sort of like a US primary, except that the only people who get to participate uh, are, are the uh, party diet members themselves and a few representatives from, from prefectural party chapters. Um, but that doesn't mean that public opinion is, is irrelevant, uh, since the party, of course, has a collective interest in maintaining the strength of its label. And if you know, Abe comes to be seen as more of a liability than an asset, um, <laughs> then there's a real possibility that he could be uh, ousted from within, which of course would in effect give us uh, a new prime minister. <clears throat> um, and as it turns out, the next party presidential election is, is not that far away. It's coming up in September. Um, and so this is really not an ideal time for Abe to be suffering all these headlines uh, about the scandals. Um, and unlike the, the last party presidential elections in 2015 where Abe ran unopposed, uh, now there is you know, the actual possibility of a non-trivial set of challengers to face him. So who are these potential challengers? And uh, do, they, do they harbor opinions on, on security issues that might uh, change the status quo in any meaningful way um, that has bearing on the US-Japan relationship? Well, among the four candidates that have been receiving the most attention, um, there's really two that seem capable of, of shifting the status quo in, in different directions. Uh, that's former, former LDP Secretary General Ishiba Shigeru and uh, a current Foreign Minister Konotaro. <clears throat> okay, so uh, I apologize, this is in Japanese. Uh, so Konotaro is a long-standing and popular uh, reformist in the party who tends to lean uh, more left than the rest and it is generally considered pretty Asia-centric. Um, and here you, you see a question to the four candidates with Abe at the bottom <laughs> um, asking about whether Japan should strengthen its, its military capabilities. And you can see that Taro is really the only outlier there. Um, Ishiba Shigeru is a, is a more hawkish uh, military expert who tends to lean more right uh, than the rest, at least on the question of strengthening Japan's military capabilities and, and legal standing. Um, and here you see him as the only outlier on a question about whether Japan should adhere to the long-standing three non-nuclear principles. This is the idea that, that Japan will never uh, manufacture, uh, uh, hold, or, or let allow for the introduction of nu nuclear weapons in its territory. Um, so there is the possibility that, that a Kono administration could push Japan towards more of a focus on Asia, or that an Ishiba administration could push Japan uh, in the direction towards more military independence. <laughs> but on the whole, uh, I don't really think either of these scenarios uh, would really entail a wholesale abandonment of the alliance. It, it seems more likely that they would entail a, a continuation of the alliance uh, with maybe some further balancing, which Abe himself, as Diana was saying, is already really engaged in, um, uh, or, or a continuation of the alliance with maybe a stronger uh, military Japan, which again, Abe himself very much wants. He's trying to increase the, the uh, military spending to 2%. Um, and, and that's also very much in line with US interests anyway. So the takeaway really is that, at least in the security dimension of Japan's foreign policy towards the United States, um, the only real threat to the status quo comes from these marginal ideological differences within the ruling coalition itself. And that threat is not, not a very strong one. <clears throat> um, OK, so I think I'll actually stop there and leave any discussions on the economic dimension uh, to the Q&A. Thanks. Charles? Yes. Okay. <laughs> uh, next speaker is uh, Dr. Kyoichi Marutsu, um, professor of international studies um, of um, Kansai Jakun University. And uh, I know that he was a dean of the School of International Studies until uh, this March. And uh, he, you are on sabbatical this year. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for coming out. 
from the sabbatical. Um, I'm, okay. I know that how precious it is, um, the sabbatical after serving as a dean right. uh, for uh, years. Um, and uh, uh, Dr. Mar uh, Dr. Dr. Marx uh, is uh, a political sociologist. And um, so uh, to me, right, you know, sociology is kind of providing micro foundation to political science. And then, as I said, domestic politics is a micro foundation to international relations. So uh, today, we expect him to give us a kind of micro, micro foundation of international relations. Uh, please join me for welcoming Dr. Marx. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Well, this is time is pushing in, and I wish I could skip my uh, presentation, but <laughs> sorry. <laughs> but, um, I'm very pleased he, to, to be here uh, in this symposium, and I would like to uh, express my great uh, uh, gratitude to the Southern Methodist University and the, all the uh, member of the panel and the, all the attendants. Um, well, uh, I would like to today. Today, I would like to talk, uh, contribute to the uh, uh, one of my own research interests, uh, political communication in the social media. Uh, specifically, I would talk about the uh, growing uh, anti-foreignism in Japan uh, from two perspectives. Uh, one is the development of social media. The second is the growing uh, economic disparity uh, in Japan. What is it? Here? Yeah. Okay, that's the contents. Well, uh, let me start with the so called uh, conservative swing uh, in Japanese public opinion. Well, um, uh, there's various discussions uh, about uh, uh, the conservative swing, but um, it seems to be widely accepted. Um, that Japanese public opinion gradually showing a, a conservative tendency, uh, and that the tendency is more uh, remarkable uh, on social media. And um, first of all, I, I would like to define conservative swing uh, in this presentation, and I will just focus on the, uh, the uh, 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 foreign policy, hardline foreign policy, or the uh, uh, negative attitude towards the immigrant and uh, uh, foreigners. Um, just uh, today, I will skip the uh, aspect of the uh, income distribution policy. And uh, so, uh, in this presentation, and I will call uh, those who only uh, satisfy the. Uh, 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 Foreign policy, uh, anti-foreign uh, uh, policy, uh, uh, just, just conservative or right-wing. Okay. I'm sorry. Or, hmm? 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 Okay. Okay. And uh, first, um, I would like to uh, uh, mention the development of social media, uh, one of the most important factors of the conservative swing of the Japanese public opinion. Um, this, uh, it's, it's a remarkable uh, progress of social media over the past decades has caused the phenomena which is called selective exposure, They're just a lecture like, but um, selective exposure or selective viewing uh, to the, each recipient of the, uh, political information. Uh, selective uh, exposure uh, refers to the uh, that uh, to that uh, refer the recipient uh, of the media information uh, have the tendency to select specific aspect of uh, exposed information based on their prerequisite uh, perspectives, beliefs, and attitude. And uh, so. Uh, well, this uh, selective uh, uh, tendency of selective expo uh, exposure uh, is uh, some, something like the, due to the uh, diversification of media. Sorry, I changed my glass. <laughs> well, um, I'm sorry, <laughs> again. <laughs> um, then the since the mainstream uh, of the, the mass media tends to avoid uh, uh, showing the extreme debates such as uh, anti-foreign opinion, so the uh, right-wingers 
uh, would uh, find the message uh, the mo uh, that most closely matched their attitude uh, more frequently in uh, the social media than in mass media. Therefore, the poli their political attitude would be strengthened by the selective viewing of the uh, social media, se uh, several uh, right-wing social media uh, websites. This. Secondly, um, the, I would like to uh, point out the, uh, uh, the growing distrust of mass media in the 21st century, uh, especially in Japan. It is well known that the neutrality and the publicness of the mass media is frequently uh, distorted due to their business perspective. And because uh, most mass media company are profit-seeking organizations, of course. And um, uh, some survey data shows that the uh, Great East Japan earthquake was one of the opportunities that the fact was widely recognized. Uh, such as the uh, sponsorship relation between the uh, uh, nuclear-related uh, industry and the media company, etc., and the, the timing of 2011 uh, almost coincided with the spread of social media. Um, uh, thirdly, um, uh, I would like to uh, point out the rise of so-called soft news, especially in TV programs. Uh, soft news refers to uh, the journalistic style and genre uh, that obscure the line between uh, uh, information and entertainment. And this softening of the news program is a global trend. Uh, news program are uh, becoming more and more entertainment-like, and the entertainment program frequently deals the uh, topic on politics. And at this point, uh, the boundary between uh, hard news and soft news seems to be uh, ambiguous, especially in Japan because of the power structure within TV station and the uh, relationship with the advertisement agencies. So um, uh, such softening of the uh, uh, news program uh, reduced the uh, difference uh, between the uh, contents of TV news and the, that of social media. As a result, the viewers of uh, media contents come to recognize that newspaper and TV program can be replaced by the social media in terms of gathering politics-related information, uh, though it is not exactly true. But So uh, next, uh, I would like to move to the, uh, uh, I will talk about uh, the uh, characteristic of the political opinion of frequent internet users. Uh, because of time constraint today, I would draw them out roughly uh, together with several results uh, of the uh, uh, representative surveys. And I briefly summarized them in the uh, uh, following six points. Firstly, um, the ratio of the internet uh, right-wingers uh, is uh, estimated to be 1.8% among the total sample of the uh, Tsuji uh, survey at uh, Osaka University. And uh, Tsuji estimated that this ratio is estimated to be uh, actually a little bit less than 1% in consideration of sample bias. And, and so and Tsuji also pointed out uh, that um, uh, the ratio of those who have anti-China, anti-Korean attitude and patriotic uh, conservatism was steadily growing and uh, nearly tripled in uh, this decade. In this decade, yes. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Secondly, second point. Um, uh, Kimura Tadamasari University analyzed that the, uh, polit uh, the politics related posting and tweet on the internet and pointed out that uh, uh, some internet accounts repeatedly uh, express. Uh, uh, hatred for South Korea and China, uh, criticism for uh, the mass media, and the uh, uh, discomfort with the ethnic minority uh, who insist the right of the weak. And, and uh, those repeated posting amplify 
the uh, right-wing tendency of the public opinion in the internet. Third point. Uh, according to the uh, uh, survey by Durango Corporation, uh, Durango Corporation, which is the uh, uh, video sharing company uh, operating Nico Nico Doga, uh, Nico Video, and uh, it's a very big survey. But, and uh, this, uh, the majority of the respondent uh, internet user was pessimistic about Japan's future. And most of the re respondents think that the outcome of the Japanese economy is unfairly distributed. Fourth point, again, from the Wango survey. Uh, the country which the respondent, uh, respondent hate most is concentrated of three countries. South Korea, 38.1%, uh, China, 22.1%, and North Korea, 18.3%. Uh, and the ratio of anti-South Korea feeling is much higher in male in 30s and 40s. Fifth point, uh, about 60% uh, of people uh, who support, uh, so who has supported party were LDP supporters. Uh, that's uh, very big. And uh, looking at this by gender, the supporting LDP, uh, rate of LDP in male is much higher. And so uh, together with the, uh, uh, all the surveys of Tsuji or Doang or Kimura, et cetera, and to sum up, and uh, the typical characteristic of the conservative internet user, including internet right-wingers, are roughly drawn as such. Uh, uh, relatively highly educated male, in 30s and 40s, and uh, despite having consciousness belonging to middle class, they, their actual income is relatively low. And uh, they frequently contact with news websites with conservative and anti-foreign opinion. And uh, it's a kind of... Uh, 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 assumption, but... Uh, uh, their uh, dissatisfaction, uh, their highly educated but low income, uh, may lead to sending of offensive anti-foreign comments in the internet space with anonymity. Okay. So, um, so far, um, I have stated that the uh, uh, Japanese public opinion shifted uh, uh, towards the uh, right wing uh, that is strengthened by the selective contact with the uh, uh, conservative website, uh, etc. But and, and the conservative and anti uh, and that the conservative and anti foreign uh, political attitude have some relationship with gender and uh, living standard. So uh, this uh, imply that the uh, uh, conservative swing or right wing shift in Japan is relevant to the expansion of economic disparity. And uh, uh, I would like to uh, look at this point based on the analysis of the uh, Kenji Hashimoto Waseda University. And Hashimoto, uh, our, our argument based on the uh, SM, SM survey, uh, that is a large scale survey uh, done in every five years, uh, as, are as follows. Uh, firstly, uh, now, the, uh, and it's in uh, uh, 2015, or this data, but um, Japan's poverty rate is estimated to be uh, 50%. Second, uh, in uh, single parents' households, uh, the poverty rate exceeds 15%. Thirdly, uh, the number of non-regular employees accounts for about 15% of total working population. The most of them are non-regular workers uh, throughout their lives. And their average annual income is below 2 million yen, below 2,000 US dollars. And uh, their poverty rate reaches uh, nearly 40%. Uh, fourth. Uh, this amazing data, but uh, unmarried rate of the non-legal employee is 66.4% for male and 56.1% for females. 
And so uh, in such a social situation, I would like to describe the political attitude of Japanese people, uh, just developing Hashimoto's discussions. I will set two axes. Um, one is the strengths of the foreign, uh, anti-foreign attitude in supporting hardline foreign policy, uh, that is the uh, uh, horizontal line. And the vertical line is the uh, uh, degree of supporting uh, in, uh, income distribution policy. Uh, based on two axes, I will classify the uh, uh, political attitude of recent Japanese in uh, four groups. And uh, just uh, uh, because of the time constraint, I will uh, skip uh, some explanation. But uh, today, uh, this time, uh, I would like to focus on the fourth group, uh, the equally uh, equality-oriented under foreigners. Uh, this, uh, uh, I would like to uh, pay attention to this group, and uh, uh, this group uh, support the redistribution policy limited to their own nationals uh, domestically, and uh, argued uh, hardline foreign policy having anti-China, anti-South uh, Korean feeling. And this social group has apparently not only uh, 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 appeared not only in Japan but also worldwide. But uh, in case of Japan, it's, it's uh, uh, rising. And now, so uh, so I will call them. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm I'll call them rather uh, low-income conservatives or lower-class conservatives. And uh, so uh, how uh, does such uh, emergence of low-income conservative relate to the uh, support for the political party and the political choice in Japan? And uh, so Hashimoto, based on his survey, uh, he pointed out, and I will almost agree who, with his point, but um, that uh, the relationship, uh, the following point among, uh, on the uh, relationship among support of political party, the political attitude, and the expansion of economic disparity in Japan. Firstly, uh, the supporting rate for the Liberal Democratic Party, LDP, is uh, risen slightly in the 20s and 30s after to, uh, 1995. Uh, secondly, uh, the, uh, the proportion of those who clearly recognize the widening of economic disparity in Japan is far lower in the support of LDP. Uh, and uh, on the contrary, the, uh, uh, it's, uh, the uh, rate is relatively small in the uh, supporters of clean government party or Skometo. Third point, the proportion of the uh, people who uh, support income distribution policy is remarkably lower in LDP supporters, just uh, contrary to the CGP, CGP or Komito supporters. Fourth, uh, the ratio of those who have anti-foreign feeling is remarkably high uh, in LDP supporters. Uh, it is clearly lower in Komito supporters. Again, the uh, uh, clear division can be observed inside the uh, current uh, coalition government. Fifth, uh, the, in the lower uh, uh, in a low income class, uh, the positive correlation can be observed between supporting income distribution policy and anti-foreign attitude. It implies that the increase in low income class will promote anti-foreign atmosphere of the Japanese public opinion. Okay, well, let me sum up. Well, uh, so, so just uh, in the expansion of economic disparity and the emergence of the new lower class in Japan uh, has brought about the conservative shift of public opinion and the development of social media and the uh, progress of selective viewing have promoted this trend to some extent. Second, uh, LDP CGP uh, coalition government is supported by both traditional conservatives and lower class anti-foreign conservatives. Uh, but their supporters of LDP, the, the supporters of LDP and C, uh, CGP have different uh, support trend with uh, regard to the income distribution policy. Uh, third, uh, 
uh, in reality, the current uh, coalition government is proceeding to reduce social security based on the concept of uh, self-responsibility, etc. But uh, under this, uh, cur the current coalition regime, uh, voters who support hardline foreign policy cannot choose a government by distribution policy. For us. Uh, the, uh, this uh, uh, combination of the hardline falling policy and ambiguity in the contribu uh, uh, distribution policy is effective at their campaign strategy. And, and uh, the bells uh, within the LDP uh, have lost their voice. Fifth, uh, the uh, political choice of the low-income conservative may be irrational. Uh, they might be aware of their irrationality, uh, but they, they feel they have to, uh, no choice but to vote for the ruling party. So uh, some of them uh, might be uh, disseminating uh, their frustrations uh, with uh, aggressive comments on social media. Of course, uh, so it's time is almost coming, so uh, there's many discussion points, but later. Thank you. I'd like to be a discussant uh, of this uh, panel, um, Dr. Masahiro Yamada, um, prominent political scientist uh, in Japan and uh, uh, working on Japanese politics. Uh, political participation, uh, survey research, um, public opinion. Um, and uh, Yamada-sensei is the first one, first KGU faculty who I knew, uh, who I met. And uh, he has been always nice um, to younger people. And uh, so uh, those, my students uh, who, um, who think that you know, I'm I may be nice to you. Um, that's actually um, um, Yamada Sensei's influence, and uh, he has been a role model uh, in terms of, you know, professors should be nice uh, to uh, their students. <laughs> um, so um, that's my uh, personal introduction uh, of uh, uh, Yamada Sensei. Please join me for uh, welcoming uh, Dr. Yamada. Uh, thank you for a uh, wonderful uh, introduction for myself, and Professor Takeuchi. And uh, I also uh, say thank you uh, for inviting me as a discussant. Uh, it's really great honor. And I'm going to start. And uh, we have here uh, three presentations, wonderful presentations. And uh, Professor Wilson's uh, work is uh, to analyze support for Trumpism and by American voters. Uh, using uh, American national election uh, data set, uh, which is really a golden standard of, uh, for our uh, po we political scientists and over the world. And on the other hand, uh, Professor Reeves' presentation focuses on attitude and parties, politicians, using data set uh, by uh, Waseda and uh, Yomiri Shimpun's project. Uh, which is really counterpart of uh, Todai Asahi <laughs> survey, <laughs> it's rival, uh, but really a fantastic contribution uh, for academic uh, research. Uh, and Professor Marx introduced uh, current researches about public opinion in Japan, and especially focuses on uh, in the uh, internet users. And all of them are very informative for us, and uh, thanks very much. And uh, from these uh, three presentation, uh, I find a common concern. And that is the quality of go democratic governance in the US and Japan under rising exclusionism and uh, hostilities. In the US, uh, Trump won at uh, presidential race, uh, but lost at uh, popular votes, uh, just like uh, uh, George Walker Bush. Uh, and his readership uh, seemed to be regarded as dangerous, uh, especially by intellectuals. On the other hand, uh, in Japan, we have a long-lived cabinet, uh, but which shows a little bit autocratic attitude at discussion in parliament, uh, tampering public documents, 
and uh, Morikake issues, and uh, so on. And in order to control our government and make uh, electoral systems uh, uh, democratically accountable, we need a strong opposition, but we don't have it. And such concerns is not peculiar, peculiar for us. Sorry. And in the, uh, Britain, uh, as you know, uh, Brexit was uh, decided. And uh, many European countries are bothered with right-wing populism. And the variety of democracy projects in Gothenburg University, uh, right high picture, Sweden, has published the annual report uh, in 2018, which warned us that autocratization is now manifesting in number of large numbers, including Brazil, India, Russia, Turkey, uh, and the United States. And it affects us uh, one third of uh, world's population, uh, some 2.5 billion people. On the other side, uh, economic growth at authoritarian regime like China, Russia, seems to be changing the global power balance. Under circumstance, uh, we're asking whether our electoral democracy can survive or move toward electoral autocracy or authoritarianism. And holding such awareness of the problems, uh, I'd like to uh, ask two questions to Professor Wilson. Uh, the one is about the impact of Russian interference uh, to the 2016 presidential election. Uh, was it effective to make Trump win? How do you think, and if you know good research about it, please let us know. And the prevention from election meddling had become a topic among the G7 summit, as you know. Then the second question is, uh, whether we will be able to have good measures or methods to prevent from measuring or interfering by foreign countries. And then I'd like to comment on to uh, Professor Reeves' presentation, which shows us politicians' attitude towards about uh, foreign policy and national defense. These issues, including revision of the Article Number no. 9 of Japanese Constitution, keeps on being a very important factor to explain ideological cleavage among not only parties and politicians, but also Japanese voters, as depicted by Kabashima and Takenaka. Uh, Kabashima was my mentor, and now he is the governor of Kumamoto Prefecture. And then my questions to uh, Professor Reeves are, uh, do you have any advices to uh, Japanese party leaders in fragmented oppositions to make their parties uh, stronger? And do you think the LDP should revise the Article Number no. 9 for own dominance, which may be an obstacle to create uh, united, maybe stronger oppositions? And before uh, proceeding um, my comments to Professor Marcus, uh, please permit, uh, allow me uh, to introduce my work. I am the, uh, one of the members of planning committee in the Comparative Study of Electoral Systems. This is called CSES. And CSES is a uh, collaborative program of research among election study team from around the world. This project has completed uh, data collection as cross-national data sets for four times, and now is collecting data along the module four, I'm um, sorry, module five, which focuses on populism. And this is conceptual framework of uh, populism at the CSS module five. And we regard populist attitude as consisted with three components, uh, attitude towards elite, uh, anti-establishment sentiments, and attitude towards majority rule and representative democracy, and attitude towards out groups, for instance, minorities and immigrants. And my colleague and myself uh, collected the module five data in Japan after this 2017 snap election. Then I'd like to use the data for comments. This table shows, uh, sorry, uh, character is so small. <laughs> So small, and this table shows uh, Japanese attitude toward out groups. Uh, 
we have here five questions. Uh, a is minorities should adapt to the customs and tradition of Japan. Uh, question 5B, the will of the majority should always prevail, even over the right of majority, uh, minorities. C, immigrants are generally good for Japan's economy. D, Japan ca Japanese culture is generally harmed by immigrants. E, immigrants increase crime rate in Japan. And when we looked at this table, uh, the most frequent categories neither agree or nor disagree, which shows almost uh, 40%, including don't know responses. The half of Japanese is indecisive uh, about them. I don't know whether this may be easy to move on exclusionist side or not. And the next table is cross tabulation between the attitude toward redistributed policy uh, by government and the proxy variable of party support. Uh, as former variable, we ask to our respondents and uh, please say to uh, what extent you agree or disagree with the following statement. The government should take measures to reduce the difference in income level. And uh, as the proxy variable of party support or party identification in the US, we ask them which party represents your views best, showing the rest of parties. And the result of the table seemed to be contradictory with Professor Marx's argument. And my question, you know, basically, uh, Party support is indifferent about the attitude toward redistributive policy, support of redistributive policy. <clears throat> Maybe almost 70% Japanese uh, agree to uh, redistribution, uh, also in the LDP supporters. Uh, yeah. This relationship and, and statistically insignificant. Uh, we, we can't find uh, difference. And one more. Uh, my question to Professor Marx uh, is, uh, how do we evaluate the influence of effectiveness of inter uh, internet light wingers to the public opinion? And how can we be robust against such manipulation to, uh, to public opinion formation? Uh, at the use of net, and the LDP seem to be the most well-organized and well-funded. Internet is really uh, a field of ba air battle. And, Professor Marx mentioned the selective exposure. Uh, I I'd like to know selective, ex selective exposure produced uh, like, like a uh, polarization of public opinion like the US or not. Uh, if uh, they are not influential for making public opinion formation, we can ignore them. That's all. Thank you so much. Now I'd like to invite all the panelists on the podium and uh, we'll go uh, a little bit over time as we started a little bit late. So, um, um, and um, um, I'd like to have a um, um, discussion. Um, but I think that um, we will uh, take some, a few questions first. Um, and then together, um, together later, uh, I'd like you to uh, the panelists to answer uh, the questions all together. Together with the, both the uh, question uh, by the um, discussant as well as the question from the floor. So, um, who wants? Do you have any question? Idu um, Sensei. Um, Thank you very much uh, uh, for uh, uh, very interesting, excellent uh, presentations. Um, uh, it's a general, uh, Harui Guchi, uh, School for International Studies. Uh, uh, my, my question is general uh, regarding the Japanese situation. Um, on the one hand, we do have this um, increased, um, I guess, percentage of um, um, non-regular workers. And, and my question, one, one question I have is, what is, is are there like threshold indicators uh, by doing a cross-sectional analysis of other countries regarding the uh, percentage of non-regular workers in the workforce, what, uh, uh, the income bracket, and then uh, those indicators, indicators pointing towards rise of populism. 
And then my second question is, um, Japan does have some antidote to um, rise of um, the social discontent in that a lot of municipalities and prefectural governments are resorting to provision of free tuition for uh, kids going to public school, uh, uh, in, uh, in high school, right? Because in Japan, uh, high school is uh, not a part of mandatory education. Uh, mandatory education is up to ninth grade. So, um, so free high school tuition and then uh, free um, medical uh, tw uh, uh, fees. Uh, you know, uh, the municipalities pick up the tab for uh, uh, for uh, doctors' visitations by uh, for kids uh, from you know birth to uh, in some instances up to high school. So, uh, but. We, we can't keep on, go can we keep on going uh, with the degree of deficit we have vis-a-vis -vis GNP? I think Italy has, uh, maybe has finally passed Japan and Greece uh, has done so, but we're, you know, one of the worst in the industrialized countries with regards to the deficit situation. So, thank you. I'd like to ha uh, take a few uh, more questions uh, from the floor. So. Any um, additional questions or comments? Okay, then I would like to um, ask the uh, panelists to uh, respond. Uh, include, oh, one, okay, yeah. Exactly. I'm just interested in, um, maybe there could be a little discussion about the direction of the Japanese economy in the post-bubble era, if that's all right. So, uh, as in, um, the policy of credit creation by the central bank throughout post-World War II leading up to the 90s and the burst, what kind of new um, policies should be in place today um, in, in terms of you know, the direction of Japan's economy and, and what any thoughts that you all have on that? Okay, um, any other question? Okay. Uh, yeah, Nico. Hi, thank you. Um, this is a question for Professor Wilson. I was wondering, um, you, you made this distinction between um, people who supported uh, Trump in the primaries versus the general election. I wonder if you have any sense of whether there was a change in the attitudes of people who didn't support Trump in the primary but then voted for him anyway, did they start endorsing some of those views in the, the split that you showed? Or do we know anything about that? Okay, uh, now um, I'd like the panelists to um, uh, respond. And I, th I think including um, Yamada-sensei uh, would have some um, response to uh, some of the questions. So, <laughs> um, so starting with Matthew. Okay, I'll uh, uh, speak both to uh, Nico's question um, and also to uh, Yamada Sensei's uh, question and say just a word about the, the general um, comparative question about uh, marginal workers. So, with regard to the people who supported President Trump, um, there's always a psychological tendency for people to avoid cognitive dissonance. <laughs> and part of that means that they try to rationalize their choices and preferences, which means that if they're going to support someone who disagrees with them on certain issues, they will tend to, even subconsciously, bring their own positions more into conformity with the person that they're supporting so as to be more psychologically comfortable with their, their choice. And there's a lot of good... Uh, political psychology experimental work that shows this to be the case because uh, now that doesn't mean that people are going to fall lockstep behind Donald Trump but certainly there's a tendency for people to uh, either come in line with the policy preferences of the person they ended up voting for or to minimize the, si the significance of the issues on which they disagree with him so um, I think some of both of those things happen um, but it's still the case that there are significant sec uh, sectors of Republican voters who disagree with Trump on, on certain issues, like particularly things like building the Mexican border wall. Um, there are a lot of Republicans who don't agree with that, don't think that that's um, a particularly good idea. Um, so, you know, the, there's, there's some tendency to come along with Trump, 
but I think it's more a phenomenon of people just kind of downplaying the salience of the issues where they have policy uh, disagreements with him. Um, as far as the questions go about Russian uh, influence in the U.S. elections, you know, Russian influence, as far as we know, as far as what we can prove, was largely just a question of, um, you know, fueling annoying and incendiary commentary on social media. Um, that, that is, uh, having people stoke disagreement, make extreme statements in online platforms, um, and in, including on both sides of an issue, right? That is, a lot of times these uh, uh, Russian trolls, Russian bots, would make inflammatory statements um, coming from both the left and the right, just to kind of fuel the level of anger and vitriol in the discourse. And uh, it appears that that happened not just in the United States, that this is a Russian operation in a variety of democratic societies around the world to try to, try to increase the anger and tenor of left-right disagreement um, across a variety of societies. There's not a lot that we can realistically do about that uh, in a society that prioritizes free speech, uh, that prizes free discourse. You know, we're not going to start to weed out people's uh, political commentary on these online platforms. Now, you know, if Russian election interference means actually tampering with voting machines or tabulations, that's a whole other story. I mean, and that's, that's something where uh, the, the response would have to be dramatic and immediate. But in terms of just trying to frame the political discourse in uh, the United States or other democratic societies, I'm afraid there's not much we can do about that. That is all, all we can do is try to educate people to, to be more intelligent in their consumption of political media, uh, to be more thoughtful in their engagement with uh, political discourse. Uh, and I'm not sure that we have evidence that this Russian involvement really change the outcome of the election. That's entirely speculative. That is, you know, people can say, well, you know, this, this Russian involvement made people angrier and that may have helped fuel the rise of, of Donald Trump, but uh, there really isn't any kind of good quantitative demonstration that that's the case. So it's very much an open question of whether this Russian involvement made any difference uh, to the final outcome at all. I mean, I will say they tried the same thing in France and did not produce any kind of surge in support for Marine Le Pen. So, I mean, you know, there are limits to what they can do by just making angry Facebook posts uh, and, and things like that and, uh, you know, YouTube comments. So um, the last thing very quickly I'll say, and then I'll pass uh, on the microphone about <clears throat> the effect of these kind of marginal workers or, or uh, people in economic distress. One frequent misperception about the support for Donald Trump is that it was somehow fueled by economically marginal people. Um, basically, every analysis that we have of the 2016 election shows that this was not the case. That is, that, that Donald Trump's rise was not fueled by poor people. Right? Poor people overwhelmingly did not vote for Donald Trump. Donald Trump's support base is overwhelmingly middle class. So it's overwhelmingly people who are, by any objective standard, relatively prosperous. I mean, by world historical standards, you know, people who are in the American middle class in 2018 enjoy a standard of living that 99% of the people who have ever lived on this planet would have seen as wildly beyond their imagination, right? So in, in no objective sense are the people who supported Donald Trump in an economically marginal or precarious position. But they're in a psychologically precarious position in terms of their cultural identity, in terms of their perception of nationhood and personhood and who they are and, and where, where their identity rests. And so, you know, I think that analyses of support for Trump that root themselves primarily in economic marginalization um, uh, are really missing the main story, which is which is a story of of cultural vulnerability, and you know we could say a lot more about that, but I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Thanks, Matt. Uh, okay, I'll try to get it at some of these. Um, let me start with with some of the many questions that Yamada Sensei posed. Um, you, I think you started off by saying there's there's like this uh, general. Uh, perception of, of a decline of, of democratic order and a rise of authoritarianism. And I guess you can kind of see signs of that 
in Japan, sort of. I mean, not anywhere near like you, you are seeing elsewhere. Um, but, you know, like Abe passed the national secrets law in, in 2015, so there's this like heightened censorship. Um, uh, this ex Another extending the amount of terms that he can serve as LDB president, right? It's now three terms instead of two. There's all the cronyism um, and, and corruption. Uh, so yeah, I guess there's some signs of that, but the left has not been able to capitalize on it, right? Um, for for whatever reason, and I, I mentioned, you know, part of the reason, probably one of the biggest, is is that they have all these ideological divisions that they're hampered with. Um, but you know, they they also face uh, institutional uh, hurdles in in Japanese elections, which are now held under a different set of electoral rules, um, where it's a combination of single member districts like we have in the states. And, and a PR system, and in those single member districts, which is like the bigger, accounts for a bigger chunk of the, of the seats in the diet, um, that's not a system that's very favorable to small parties. And so it's hard for them to, to thrive in that. They have to coordinate, and, and because of that ideological division, it's difficult to coordinate. Um, so you ask, like, what can they do in this situation? And it, you know, it's a tough question. There really, <laughs> there isn't much they can do. But if, and, and this might sound somewhat unrealistic, but if they were actually able to, uh, put, say, electoral reform back on the agenda, uh, as it was in 94. And remember that in electoral reform is very rare. It's not easy to, to you know, create a groundswell of support for making that happen. But it did happen in Japan. And it was sold to the public on this idea that it was going to correct all of the, the corruption that was coming out of the old SNTV system, right? Well, if they could somehow, uh, I guess, create a, an idea of doing that and, cre and maybe uh, turn it, reforming Japan's electoral rules to be more proportional, um, then that would really help them, right? If, that was, if, if they were able to get public support for, for that kind of reform based on this idea that it's going to correct all this cronyism that we still see in Japanese politics, that would, that would really help them because you know, the LDP support, um, you know, they're, they're doing very well because those single member districts benefit big parties, but they're Overall support's not big, right? It's like 30% uh, sometimes in these elections. And, and if you're in a proportional system, that's not gonna cut it. You're not gonna be able to dominate with two-thirds majority uh, like they are now. They're gonna have to, to coordinate with a lot of different other parties. So uh, that's kind of an unconventional, but maybe a potential, <laughs> potential way for them to uh, solve this long-standing coordination problem that we've seen for, for uh, forever, um, with maybe the exception of the DPJ, which didn't last. Uh, you asked about Article 9 as well. Um, I, as far as its feasibility, yeah, this, of course, this continues to be a really salient um, thing. It's, it's one of Abe's uh, most ambitious projects. And you know, he's got the seats in the Diet to do it. It requires a two-thirds majority in both houses plus a, a referendum to the public uh, where it just has a majority vote. But that majority vote is, is not certain, right? I think the latest polling uh, now and for a while has suggested that a plurality, if not a majority of voters, are not, not in favor of like a total revision of Article 9, right? Now, I don't know if that's going to be sellable uh, to the public. So that'll be his biggest challenge in doing that. Um, should Japan do it? You know, is it, is it in Japan's interest? This is a risky thing for me to answer because it's a very salient and divisive issue. Um, but I'll just, I'll go on record saying that, that if the U.S., you know, continues to fall this sort of Trumpist, isolationist um, policy. If it if it you know pulls out of the region, then I don't I don't think Japan will have a choice. I think they'll have to uh, uh, find a way to normalize their their military um, in order to to guarantee their own security. Uh, that's that's my personal opinion. Um, uh, yeah, I guess maybe I'll, maybe I'll leave it at that, and I'll let my other Japanese colleagues here answer some of those. This question. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, and so, firstly, uh, answering to the Dr. Professor Yamada's question. The first, the, uh, Professor Yamada uh, shows the uh, contradictory research result. It's your own, and, and it's a kind of the uh, uh, could be my next research topic, but. Uh, <laughs> Uh, it, it may be or something like, uh, I know there are several uh, different uh, results can be shown by the uh, several researchers, but it's uh, uh, something like the, the uh, uh, because of the sample bias or uh, the, uh, the mess, uh, difference in the research method or, but, and so uh, I would like 
uh, I, I don't <laughs> answer to the, 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 the difference in your research and uh, my own presentation today, and uh, I will answer <laughs> to your question next later. But and your and next your questions: What is the the uh, rise of uh, right wingers? Uh, well, how the uh, effect the uh, the future of Japan or something like that is? Uh, I missed that several point, but. Um, um, uh, actually, the number of the internet uh, right winger is estimated to be about um, uh, one percent, or the sub uh, including their supporters, only uh, the very small number. But the problem would be the uh, 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 the voice of the right winger is much louder uh, than the liberals, and um, maybe the uh, uh, the selective viewing in the internet age at the uh, the political opinion of the. Uh, uh, citizens will be more and more diversified uh, from the uh, right wingers to the extremely left and um uh, so uh, the, the that's my uh, personal view but um internet uh, use of internet will enlarge the gap uh, among uh, Japanese uh, uh, citizens, especially in Japanese young generations, uh, the, the gap will be something like the f uh, between those who uh, uh, encourage uh, so some uh, the internet uh, will uh, encourage some uh, people uh, who actively participate in politics and election. Uh, on uh, on the other hand, uh, the uh, internet, the, the, those who uh, little uh, have little uh, interest uh, in uh, politics and political participation, uh, will uh, consume the politics-related contents in the internet as uh, entertainment or something. Like that. And um, uh, sometimes uh, Mr. Abe is consumed as an idol. In the uh, uh, two-dimension uh, con uh, contents on the uh, internet uh, world, and, so, and they, they have uh, so the uh, active uh, participant of the political participation is more and more active, and the. Uh, uh, the 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 other side. Uh, will be more uh, more and more cynical, so the gap will be uh, 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 much larger, and um, so the uh, uh, in such an era, Japanese government uh, system, uh, governance system, uh, parliamentary cabinet system, and party discipline. Uh, will increase some the frustration of the uh, uh, citizen uh, or uh, polit uh, political distrust and uh, uh, that will increase the political distrust and political cynicism and, but it, it is not a, uh, only Japan but also other countries so uh, the, my personal view is something like democratic system in the internet age will uh, converge uh, to uh, several types and um, uh, I think the, uh, the, uh, the current Japanese political system will not be able to survive uh, in the uh, uh, intermediate future, but uh, in the short term, I don't understand, uh, know what's happened. And in and, and answering to the Mr. Iguchi's question, uh, Professor Iguchi's question, that was the uh, com comparing the uh, uh, Japanese uh, Japanese case and the other uh, industrialized nations and the uh, economic disparity and something like that. Um, uh, today, I would skip such kind of uh, comparison because um, uh, so in the European case or some uh, other countries' case. Uh, the other, uh, the other very important factor that is the uh, ethnic factor, uh, uh, well included in such kind of survey. So um, uh, I uh, so, uh, corrected several data on European countries and the relationship of the uh, uh, political uh, choice in the uh, uh, 
uh, income uh, or uh, the class. Uh, and then the, but uh, the, that, uh, the result was so complicated and uh, it's not much to the today's presentation, so I skipped the results. I'm sorry. Okay, now Yamada-sensei will answer all the unanswered questions. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I have nothing to say. <laughs> uh, you, you have nothing to say or uh, any comments back to the um, panelists' um, answers uh, to your question or, or the whole discussion? Yeah. And uh, uh, I think that question will be answered uh, in the class uh, <laughs> through. <laughs> and uh, so. <laughs> um, yeah, you're taking the Japanese economy and business class right now, so <laughs> unless uh, Hirayama sensei do you want to answer the question <laughs> right now? <laughs> I'd rather not. Okay. <laughs> so in the class. <laughs> um, any other last comments or um okay, if not, um so uh, uh well uh first uh, let's uh, um conclude the panel. Uh, thank you very much for the panelists and discussion. <laughs> And now we have, uh, there's a good news, uh, we have a coffee and snack, uh, and then it's already prepared over there. Uh, and then we are, a little, we are um, behind the schedule, but I, I'd like to uh, take this uh, break um, seriously. So um, um, it's, um, let's take a 20-minute um, break uh, up to 3.50. Uh, we'll, um, uh, we will resume at 3.50, so uh, we'll have about 20 minutes. And then there's a coffee and snack over there. Um, and uh, so we will um, um, resume in uh, 20 minutes.